Hello, and welcome back. Hope you've had a chance to reflect a little bit. We know how important it is for us as educators uh, to take time to reflect and start synthesizing our learning. Maybe you had some um, reflections some thinking back on students that you've worked with and thinking about did you know their access level why might it be important to know their access level how do you get that information um, what are some of the challenges in assessment it's a huge topic and again we're just scratching the surface in this professional learning module but I do encourage you to connect with the ESL people in your building um, they're really a wealth of knowledge and this is our area of specialty we're happy to help people out because we know again that we're all language teachers all right let's look at a little bit more behind the scenes um, background information about how we work with um, how we assess how we identify and how we start instructing ELL students when kids come to us they meet with folks in the ESL department and we have to figure out um, if there's another language at home we have to document that we usually um, right away do a home language survey to learn about the language history at home who speaks what how long everything that we can to help us learn about the family and about the student and then we do an access screener to get their language level because again we need to know what their language level is this is like a, um, a shortened version of the access test that ESL teachers do right away to get a level on the kids and then uh, we admit them to the ESL program give them a choice if they're able to be in a bilingual program if they're a Spanish speaker and they want to do that they have the right to attend a bilingual school if they do not speak Spanish they have the right to have ESL services um, and even Spanish speakers choose not to be in bilingual schools um, so in order to be admitted to whatever program they choose in our district um, or in any district in that matter in the country we need to get parent permission through a parent letter all right let's take a look at the language of in, um, the ELL levels language of level uh, language proficiency well, hey, that's a tongue twister <laughs> as I said earlier it's a it's a process and it takes time and we move through the levels from one all the way up to five now I myself I and maybe you are seven which means I've never been an ELL I've always had English as my first language the goal for all students that are ELLs is to become a level six okay this process again takes years um, it can happen as soon as four years if instruction is really really well tailored and if the factors um, the students highly motivated and other factors are in place within the student so keeping that in mind it takes several years to get to this point <clears throat> I mentioned it earlier I'm going to talk about it again huge piece of second language acquisition is understanding the difference between that social language playground language or BICS as it's called by researcher Jim Cummins basic interpersonal communication skills and then that other language that takes longer and is harder to see often when kids are just talking but you can see it in the reading and writing and you can see it in their academic performance that's the CALP the academic language the cognitive academic language proficiency this is what takes a long time to get to kids here are developing their BICs they're getting really really good at that playground language but boy does it take a long time to get that deep deep knowledge base and usage and command of the academic language as I mentioned before Jim Cummings is the guy who um, kind of put this this theoretical framework together for us what's important for you to know about it again is that it just takes a couple years for the BICs to come and it definitely takes longer for the CALPs to come um, and then again we're really just scratching the surface here there's a lot more to talk about when it comes to how difficult language is but just one example is that if a student is using table as a easy BIX word like for example the teacher says can you go sit down at that table for reading for reading time but then they're also going to come across it in other content areas with a completely different meaning like for example um, we're going to do a science experiment and put this data into a table so the multiple meaning words are very difficult for students um, slang is very difficult for students but again they do pick that up pretty quickly um, idioms are very difficult for students um, really crazy when you talk about raining cats and dogs I mean what does that really mean shooting fish in a barrel very confusing for students they they're understanding it literally so we need to be aware of the language that we're using and how it might be perceived if we were acquiring it as a second language 
I can't stress that enough. I really can't stress that enough. It's not just this academic vocabulary that we know all students need, but it's that colloquialism um, that we use in our everyday speech that can be very, very, very confusing for kids. So if you can take anything from this learning today, I hope that you can just monitor yourself and how you're speaking and what, what might be confusing for ELLs in your everyday language, your everyday instructional language with them. Okay, so let's take a look at these levels again. I'm going to go through them real quickly, all the way up, um, so you can see what it looks like for each of these language levels. If you have a student who's at a level one, they're often silent. It's called pre-production. They only have about 500 words in their receptive vocabulary, which means they can understand 500 words, okay? Bathroom, teacher, recess, drinking fountain, bubbler, whatever it is, okay? Um, they may not be able to speak it yet, but boy, they, can they understand it. Now, keep this in mind that your average kindergartner comes to the classroom with about 600, maybe more words. Well, we have level ones coming to us at all grade levels who have the amount of vocabulary that a kindergartner might have. So, wow, talk about feeling limited and talk about needing to scaffold our instruction for them. It's really huge that we consider um, how difficult it is to be at this stage. As I've mentioned a couple times, it doesn't always last that long, but um, we need to make them feel as comfortable as possible in order to um, feel feel relaxed and, and, f and don't feel so stressed out so that they can actually start acquiring more language. We know with all students that the more stressed out they are, the more their brain shuts off. And um, it's a phenomenon with all students, but especially with language learners. Um, language doesn't, doesn't really get learned if, if they're feeling f like they're being forced to speak. Um, you know what I mean? If they're, if they're really cognizant of their errors, we should make them feel as comfortable as possible so that um, they're able to learn more and, and move on in the language learning process. Some ways that we can modify for them are just asking basic questions and having a lot of visual and graphic support. We'll talk more about those strategies later. <clears throat> Level two learners, uh, they're definitely producing more, so they're, they're able to speak more, and they have twice as much vocabulary as a rule, general rule of thumb. Oh, there's an idiom again, a rule of thumb. Now, oh, that's confusing, isn't it? Anyways, <laughs> this stage is also pretty quick, but um, again, they don't have any of that academic, or they have limited academic English, and we really need to allow them to make lots of errors, I'm not worrying about correcting them too much yet definitely below le level in reading and writing still, um, as you can see. Level three, this is where many, 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 many students sit at for years because it lasts a long time and um, if they don't get appropriate help, they may fossilize here. In other words, a lot of kids don't move past the level three. They stay a level three or a level four. They don't become fully proficient. And again, why is this? It's our instruction, usually. We're fooled, we're tricked that they can actually speak English really well, but why aren't they performing well? Why can't they remember the content? Why can't they apply the knowledge that we're teaching them? Well, guess what? Because maybe we're, maybe we're not giving them as much access as we could to really, really, really um, remove the language barrier and get to the content of what we're teaching. This is a very difficult stage um, for kids because again they do feel, um, again if they feel self-conscious about their language they may not ask for help and they're still going to be below grade level and you're going to see it, you're going to see it in the data, um, but this is where we can target our instruction. We can really um, they're using more vocabulary, but we can provide more vocabulary instruction for them, and um, we can provide lots of other strategies for them to move on. So again, just being aware of what are the language levels of your students and noticing if any of them are level threes, this is a really tough stage, but they still need help. Level four and level five, they still need help too. They're definitely more advanced, but they're not there yet. You can see they have a lot more vocabulary, word, uh, vocabulary words in their acumen and they're moving into more academic language, a little more than level three, and they're able to write and speak with less errors and get into more um, technical, um, technical structures of language and vocabulary, but again, often still below grade level, still need help. Level five, they're almost there, they're bridging, um, and they really 
read and write and speak is comparable to a native speaker. Definitely getting that academic language down. But again, they're not always proficient, especially in literacy. So we really want to make sure that we monitor them and give them occasional support. They might not need as much as a level one, two, or three, or four, but we really still need to make sure that they get, um, to get extra help. So again, going back to these, just being aware of what they mean and thinking of what they could, um, what that could be the implication for your instruction. Another quick note on that real quick, looking back at the access report, I just want educators, um, we'd like for educators to be aware of the fact that the access total score is a culmination of the reading, writing, listening, speaking, and oral language. So it's a holistic number, okay? Um, this child, as you can see, you know, had these, all these different um, scores here, a 5 at listening, 3.5 at speaking, 1.9 at reading, and a 3.4 at writing. Um, but her overall language level is a 3.1. So this student is a level 3, okay, when you look at the breakdown. Sure, they're a level 5, she's level 5 in listening um, and all that, but composite-wise, the reading and writing is, is weighed more, okay, because we know literacy is huge. It's, it's part of that academic language. Overall, it comes out as a three. So sh this child is a level three, and she is at the stage that is critical, critical, critical to get extra support, okay? Otherwise, she might not make it to the level four, level five, and then eventually, where we really want her to be is to be able to exit the program and not get any support and really... Um, become fully English proficient.